On behalf of our deans, Jessica Berg and Michael Scharf, welcome to our law school here at Case Western Reserve University. And thank you for joining us for the Dr. Maya Angelou and Professor Calvin Sharp Distinguished Interdisciplinary Lecture on Peaceful Conflict. Uh, the Distinguished Lecture on Peaceful Conflict seeks to highlight the work of scholars, researchers, and practitioners who have insights that contribute to the literature on the settlement of disputes. Today is April 4, 2024. It marks what would have been Maya Angelou's 96th birthday. Before Dr. Angelou became a renowned author, poet, and recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, she was a civil rights activist who assumed the role as Northern Coordinator for the New York Office of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1960. It was through this work that she met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Today also marks the day of Dr. King's assassination at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968, now 56 years ago. It has been reported that Dr. Angelou did not celebrate her birthday for many years because of the painful connection to Dr. King's assassination. We've had several of these lectures um, over the last few years since I've been in this role. Uh, and we've had folks come talking generally about peaceful conflict resolution, um, focusing on Dr. King's legacy. Uh, but I was absolutely overjoyed when we found a scholar uh, uh, that focused on the work of Dr. Maya Angelou. And so I'm gonna take some time to introduce Dr. Sebro uh, later. Uh, but first I wanna talk about Dr. Calvin, uh, Professor Calvin Sharp, the Gallen J. Rausch Professor Emeritus of Law who conceived of this lecture. Professor Sharp retired after 30 years on the Case Law School faculty and was a valued colleague to many. He was also the professor who taught me employment law. <laughs> um, and it was a joy to have him in the classroom. His daughter, Dr. Adrian Jones, is here with us today. And I'd like to invite Dr. Jones down to share a few words about her dad and um, his legacy. Good afternoon. You're all um, straight until the start talking starts, <laughs> and then my tear ducts start to um, be productive. Um, you know, I'm here. Whew, I'm here to represent my dad. He's been ill for quite a long time, um, but maintains his personality and his sense of humor. And um, if you knew him, he is one of these people who um, sets the tone. And so if you are unpeaceful, um, you know, he is a force that raises you to a space of um, willingness to negotiate, willingness to participate, um, willingness to rise, to raise your positivity and willingness. Um, and that continues uh, to today. Uh, we were just talking about the um, ability to have someone who actually focuses on Maya Angelou. Um, when I get a chance to tell my father about this, um, he's going to be thrilled. Um, and Dr. Bell Hardaway, um, the fact that you have been procuring this lecture um, pleases him greatly. Um, and when I talked to him in December, I mean, I think we talked about you for like an hour. <laughs> um, and so I just want to express my own appreciation for you being here for the talk and also um, just if you could picture my dad, because I'm really here in his stead, um, just to welcome you and to um, express my excitement about the continuation of this lecture and um, the positive impact that it brings. Also, I'll just say that I hail from Morehouse College, which of course is the alma mater of Dr. Martin Luther King, who is our greatest alumni um, member. and. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, for me, there is a synergy in this, um, in my father, in what I do. Who knew you were going to become a college professor? Well, that's what your parents are doing. Um, uh, but I feel like there's a connection there, too, uh, because, uh, you know, at our institution, you know, we're interested in social justice and negotiation and peace. And I think that in this particular polarized uh, political moment, that 
these, this kind of talking, this kind of work is becoming even more important. And so, um, you know, I think it raises the profile and import of what we're doing here today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Please be sure to send your father our regards, our warm, warm, warm regards here from Case. Um, now, on to today's lecture. Uh, Dr. Adrian Sebro is joining us to today, today to deliver the Dr. Maya Angelou and Professor Calvin Sharp Distinguished Interdisciplinary Lecture on Peaceful Conflict. Dr. Sebro is an assistant professor of media studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He specializes in critical media studies at the intersections of race, socioeconomic gender, performance, and black popular culture. His first book, Scratching and Surviving, Hustle Economics and the Black Sitcoms of Tandem Productions, which explores a production history of black economics in the all black cast sitcoms of Sanford and Son from 1972 to 1977. I'm gonna date myself. These are all the shows of my childhood. Um, Good Times, 1974 to 1975 and The Jeffersons, 1975 to 1985. His book, Scratching and Surviving, was published earlier this year by Rutgers University Press, and I'm genuinely looking forward to reading it. Dr. Sebro is also a faculty affiliate with the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies. Dr. Sebro's commentary and expertise have been featured on Vice TV, Variety, USA Today, NBC News, HuffPost, and CNN. As always, there will be time for question and answer at the end of his remarks and a refreshment uh, reception to follow. I believe it's upstairs, today's talk, so just, up, just directly above us, essentially. Please join me in a warm welcome to Dr. Sebro. Stuff together. First of all, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. And this is a, a sometimes difficult time of the day, so I thank you for taking out your time in this evening to come and see me talk and be part of this event. Um, honor to the, to the folks who invited me here. Thank you so much. Um, definitely great to be a part of this legacy. Um, Reading on this legacy and what is accomplished and like what's been talked about today, I'm just proud to be to now be a part of it. So thank you. Um, also honored to be here to speak uh, amidst what's going on in my at my home university or a lot of state universities in Texas um, amidst uh, the Senate Bill 17. Um, some of you may have heard about it, but it's a, a Senate bill that is doing a lot to well, it is. Um, it's about diminishing or terminating DEI initiatives at Texas public schools. And being at University of Texas at Austin, the biggest public school in Texas, uh, we're feeling that a lot. I have many friends who have lost their jobs just yesterday. Um, many DEI departments, departments that celebrate LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ plus IA folks, uh, departments being eliminated, um, getting rid of black grads for students, like various things happening under the guise of, of equity, right? Um, so, to be here and to have this important conversation. I'm just thankful to be in a place that welcomes these type of discussions. Um, we're doing what we can to fight against a lot of these issues, but it's difficult, right? We're trying to find ways to um, galvanize our students. So that's, that's the one thing a lot of these uh, government officials aren't considering is how this affects the student body. Um, we're already seeing a low en lower enrollment for the next year, which us as faculty are like, obviously, right? Um, who would want to come to a space like this where they can't be celebrated? or their identity is not, not seen as important to them. Um, something as small as uh, a speaker was coming for a different, different department, however, the UT Legal came in and um, denied them to be able to speak because their, their talk had the title, had the word queer in it. So things like this are starting to be fought against, right? So to be here to talk about this work um, and finding some discussion of how it has basis in the present is very important. So again, I just thank you all for being a part of this and being in this space. All right, so let me get into this. <clears throat> this conversation considers black public affairs programs such as Black Blues Black as an intervention in television representation and a site for contesting the very meanings and logic of both race and television apparatus. 
Blacks Blues Black was nearly forgotten, and the lack of awareness of, of this program is yet another tragic example of black history being ignored for the interest of television history that lends to racial hegemony and white liberal sensibilities. The politics surrounding the location of hidden archives cannot be ignored in this case, said best by media scholar Devorah Heitner. Unfortunately, because television stations viewed videotape as a renewable source, episodes were often taped over rather than saved. Most programs were archived sparsely or not at all, and even those archives that do survive are frequently incomplete. In this rare case of black art, the archive survived, and now a once forgotten space of black history can be enjoyed and experienced. So in 2009, San Francisco State Film Archivist Alex Cherian was working on a project for the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, sitting through thousands of can uh, cans of film when he came across one canister with a, with a single handwritten word scribbled on the, uh, on the outside, Angela. Intrigued, Cherian queued up the film to find the poet touring a neighborhood in Watts just a few years after the 1965 uprisings had ripped through the community. In the segment, which Cherian would later, later learn was a part of a ninth episode, Angelou states the conflict, excuse me, says the conflicts in Watts represented a people, a race, fighting for survival. He spent the next four years looking for any information about the series, but found virtually nothing. In early 2013, on a whim, he called the Library of Congress and learned that they had the entire 10-hour series preserved on two-inch videotape. So why did the library have it? To make a long story short, KQED co-produced many films with National Education Television, a public broadcasting predecessor to PBS in the 60s. When NET dissolved in 1970, a part of their archive, including KQED's Black Blues Black, was transferred to WNET, New York City's public media affiliate. At some point after that, WNET deposited a small sampling of this inherited archive at the Library of Congress, where it sat untouched for decades. So with this um, untouched um, item of an archive of media history, Angelou herself passed away without ever, ever even seeing the show again, because once uh, the show ended, uh, the history of his archives were kind of pushed, across, pushed away and lost for decades. So um, I was thankful when I found this, uh, found out about the show in 2018, um, many, of the arc, many of the episodes were finally just digitized. Um, so thankfully, when I found it, I realized that no one has seen this before. No one has written about this before. Uh, this virtually has been unseen and talked about since 1968. So um, this paper took a lot. I started in 2018, and it wasn't able to be published until about, because you know, I had COVID and quarantine to it, it wasn't able to be published until 2021. So I was thankful that I was able to bring, uh, bring my voice out and bring this work to, um, to the public's eye because I think it's extremely important for this, not, for this to not be forgotten. So first, I'm going to foreground some TV history and why I think this is so important to exist in this space. So uh, in 1955-1960s, television was, was it a hugely important um, new technology for how folks were going to navigate the world. It was meant to be the space where film was, the, was considered the racist space, when television was meant to be a space uh, to promote liberal sensibilities and uh, freedom for everyone. So the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, pressured networks to offer programming that served the public good. And part of that pressure was a large speech called the Vast Wasteland Speech by the FCC Chairman Newton Manow. So the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, was created by Congress through the Com Communications Act of 1937 for the purpose of regulating interstate and foreign commerce in communication by wire and radio so as to make available so far, so as far as possible to all the people of the United States without discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, or, or sex, a rapid, efficient nationwide and worldwide wire and radio communication service. In this context, the word radio covers both broadcast radio and television. The Communications Act directs the FCC to base broadcast licensing decisions on whether the public broadcast would serve the public interests, convenience, and necessity. The commission has observed that the public interest is best served by permitting free expression of views largely following the First Amendment, right? So because of this, television was now being pressured to be um, a space that it needs to be serving the public good in some way. Yes, it can entertain. Yes, it can be kind of escapist fair, but part of it is what is being encouraged here needs to be educational. It needs to be able to serve the public in a way that's going to push them forward. So technology advances were a huge part of uh, what's happening in this moment, kind of in the uh, late, early 60s and throughout the, um, the mid-60s as well. Technological advances such as portable cameras um, and longer stints of, of news being from 15 minutes to 30 minutes and onward um, allowed 
the 60s to be this space where television is changing and the news is changing um, to coincide along with what's happening rapidly through, civil right, through a growing civil rights movement. So socially, these civil rights events, um, a lot of precipitated events were like Brown versus Board of Education, for instance, where many states were still you know, denying, um, denying um, inclusion of segregated um, uh, school spaces. Right, so all of these different uh, social events happening on TV live were hugely important and to the ratings of television to see America kind of uh, racing to figure out what's going to be next and how politics and um, policy is going to be shaped through television. So these mass boycotts and nonviolent dis civil disobedience was captured on television and TV became this new arbiter of social life and progress. So television again played a major, major role and it brings efforts and violent backlash to, to national audience. So part of television, part of uh, seeing these um, violent backlashes, specifically racial ones, particularly against black bodies, um, was part of television communicating what's happening across the world. Largely what's happening in um, Jim Crow spaces throughout the South, um, communicating that in more, more liberal spaces in the North, but largely any, uh, everywhere throughout the US where um, it may have been more understood, accepted, and more way of life in the South, but segregation and racist acts of violence were happening everywhere. Television was bringing those things to light to everyone. So Martin Luther King, a lot of folks call him the, the master TV producer in a lot of ways, whereas he realized that TV was an arbiter of being able to bring their struggle to the masses. Right, part of, you know, um, if you may have seen the film Selma, right, part of Ava DuVernay's characterization of television and what Martin Luther King is doing in this moment was to get the violent acts, part of this nonviolent resistance was to get this nonviolent resistance on television because it was a way to grow the fact that realizing that black people aren't the ones who are initiating this violence and this violent outcry, largely they're fighting for, in this case, the voting rights. So what that means is TV was that um, arbiter of like what's true, what's right, what's real, and famous speech, I Have a Dream, was one huge moment that was placed on TV, but largely King was able to be this kind of arbiter of um, how to use television in a way to push forward their movement. Also part of those who was probably even more fearful uh, than King was Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer talked directly to, at a Democratic National Convention. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer was even more, you know, King was polished, right? He went to college, wore a suit. He was that image that was of, of extreme, extreme respectability in U.S. politics and otherwise. Fannie Lee Hamer was born on you know, a tobacco farm as a sharecropper, uh, someone who really reflects a lot of the pain that these people are going through, un, un, uneducated by any formal means, but she spoke truth to power in um, for fighting for the rights for black people. So when she was able to speak at the Democratic National Convention, um, uh, LBJ actually even cut into her sp into her speech and made a uh, speech about the nine month anniversary of some random event in order to because he was so fearful of her words more than what King was doing. She was the one who had largely had nothing to lose. King was about building galvanizing people around him, and Fannie Lou Hamer was simply speaking what she felt every day working on the sh as a sharecropping fields. So one of the first civil rights activists to address the nation directly on her own terms was cut off largely um, because of the fear. So realizing how powerful TV was, um, politicians really actually even tried to push forth ways in which civil rights activists were not gonna be able to be featured on TV. They talked around them often with, rather than speaking to them directly. So as a result of television, it broadened the support for civil rights movement and it convinced networks to reflect some of this consciousness in their programming. But also what television did was it covered various uprisings that started to, um, to uh, uh, erupt in the urban metro metropolitan throughout the U.S. Pretty much through 1965 through 1967, we saw various uprisings happening and the current president at the time, Lyndon Johnson, um, had an issue with this and he wanted to find ways to stop these uprisings from happening and find answers for why they're starting in the first place. So again, uh, part of this television space was how are we going to market? How are we going to make these um, riots look and uprisings look to the greater public? And oftentimes they're demonizing black bodies while doing that. So here's a quick little video of 1965's um, CBS's Watts Riot or Rebellion. It was the most widespread, most destructive racial violence in American history. White people driving through the riot area were considered fair game. 
Their cars were battered, the drivers stoned, kicked and beaten, and the cars were burned. The mobs might groan and curse in disappointment when a white got away, and then cheer like a football crowd when a car went up in flames. The burning and looting, the shooting and beating went on for nearly a week. It began as many race riots have begun with the arrest of a Negro by white officers. Right here at this corner. In this case, two young Negroes were stopped by California Highway Patrolmen and charged with drunk driving. There was a scuffle and a crowd gathered. So ending it there, I thought it was important to just kind of show how the news was casting these uprisings, right? They're calling it a riot or revolt. In the title alone, it's placing blame on, and it's showing uh, and it's demonizing what the black, black, uh, black folks are going through in this particular neighborhood in Watts, not giving context to the reasons why they're uprising or why it's even called rebellion to them. They're calling it a riot or revolt. Right, so these demonizing languages was part of the ways that uh, television worked to cast blackness as other and to cast blackness as violent. Um, but also later on, I'll talk a little bit deeper about this uh, CBS special specifically. But it made clear uh, the white voices of the police chief and, and uh, white community members and how they felt about it, rather than the folks who are in the midst of it and why and why it happened in the first place and why it had to cat uh, catalyze such a big moment. So again, as I mentioned, with Lyndon Johnson having such an issue and having uh, wanted to find ways to, to calm down these rebellions that were happening across the metropolitan of the US, he formed a commission. So what he called the Kerner Commission, um, on, Jul on July 1967, President Lyndon Johnson Executive Order 11365, the Kerner Commission shall investigate and make recommendations with respect to the origins of the recent major civil disorders in our cities, including the basic causes and factors leading to such disorders and influence, if any, of organizations or individuals dedicated to the incitement or encouragement of violence. The development of methods and techniques for averting or controlling such disorders, including the improvement of communications between local authorities and community groups, the training of state and local law enforcement, and National Guard personnel in dealing with potential or actual riot situations, and the coordination of efforts of the various law enforcement and governmental units which may become involved in such situations, the appropriate role of the local, state, and federal authorities in dealing with civil disorders. So again, this community, excuse me, this commission of uh, 11 individuals was meant to do research across the U.S. to talk to individuals who are part of these major metropolitan communities in cities like Chicago, uh, Newark, New Jersey, um, and other parts of New York to really ask why is it that these uprisings are happening? Um, how can we fix this? What needs to be done in your, in your community to prevent these uprisings from happening? So in all, in all intents and purposes, it seemed like a great initiative. Um, this initiative of 11 people to talk to black black uh, families and black communities about what's happening only consisted of one black person, right? And in this commission, um, Johnson attempted to make clear the fact that he wants to change America for the better by taking this information on. So what came to be, through this year of doing research, it came to be a 400 page document called the, uh, the Kerner Commission Report or the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. And this report, uh, really laid out so many issues that happening in America and talking to black communities such as employment, health care, education, policing, and as relevant to our discussion today, media reporting. So of this 400 page document, uh, I want to make clear that Lyndon Johnson, who called for this commission, called for this research, denied it at the end in saying it was uh, black folks uh, passing the buck and blaming white communities for their issues, right? Um, this is what the research over a year developed, and although um, Lyndon Johnson may have denied it, it was a 400-page book that ended up becoming a national bestseller, right? So just showing how important this was for black voices to finally be heard. But what's so important about this particular uh, two pages I'm gonna show regarding the media coverage, um, black folks were fed up with the fact that they're not being able to report on their own issues in their communities. Um, television doesn't reflect their community, who they are, what they look like, and the reporting comes from an outside space, as you just saw in that Watch Wider Revolt video, um, a white commentator speaking in Watts about why black folks are uh, feeling the need to uprise. So part of this was, how can we change this? Part of the report, these are all supposed to be ways that they're pleading for change, um, and black folks were actually making it clear what we're looking for. 
even more specifically, in the section titled The Negro in the Media, it talks about this idea that um, black folks want to be seen more, more in prime time, in drama series, in advertisements, in public affairs television shows. So again, there's a very, very, very clear call for black folks to be seen and respected and for their voices to be heard, not simply in passing or in the background, but as the arbiters of these journalistic stories and as the ones who are able to talk about their own community from their own perspective. So again, uh, with this great document coming out, Martin Luther King himself called a uh, physician's warning of approaching death with a prescription for life, saying that this current commission report was listed out everything that we actually do need. That you all did the research. It's not simply me saying it this time. You, you see the evidence that's here. Um, and again, so with his support of it, you know, things were moving along. And then in 1968, um, as just mentioned, the 56th anniversary of his, of his uh, assassination, um, he was murdered kind of uh, soon after this was released and after the statement was made. So part of his assassination um, led to, of course, more uprisings throughout the U.S. And those uprisings led to folks, uh, Lyndon Johnson and other folks in the community specifically, taking into account how can we fix this? Again, how can we find ways to mitigate these issues from happen, continuing to happen? So we saw that there were ways that um, a lot of the current commission suggestions were actually being um, in conversation, particularly one regarding the media. So again, in 68, we saw so much change uh, as far as uh, television specifically. This is primetime television. You had shows featuring black, uh, black characters in, their, in lead or like um, supporting, supporting roles, in which before this, we hadn't seen black characters in lead roles since, in, since 1953 with Amos and Andy and Beulah. So in this over 10 plus years of not seeing black faces outside of, you know, in the, in the periphery on television, we started to see this um, um, growth of blackness on TV in primetime. But even these primetime roles, the visions of blackness were very sec secured. They were very um, tucked away. I mean, even Hal Cantor, the producer of the show Julius, or and Diane Carroll, said that this is meant to be an escape from reality. So you see Diane, Diane Carroll as his role as Julia, kind of ignoring the actual political moment that's happening in this time. So although we may have seen black folks now on popular TV, it's a skewed idea in view of what blackness actually is portraying, looks like. Um, so we didn't really see this view come to fruition until we look at public affairs television shows that also came together in 1968 through public funding of um, national research initiatives. So public affairs television shows like the local TV shows, uh, in essence what we think of now as PBS, right? Shows particularly like Black Journal and Soul were hugely important to this idea of um, how can we talk about blackness controlled by us and for us. So these different, in these different communities th across the US, you had a lot of local shows, you had some national shows, Black Journal and Soul being two of the national shows, given funding, so here's this money, do what you can with it. So you know, making these budgets and creating and uh, hiring all black staffs, talking about black politics, local and otherwise, uh, through Black Journal, and talking about black art, poetry, and dance through Soul. So these are the ways that we started to see blackness really come to fruition in the ways that were asked for by the Kerner Commission report, um, these shows specifically. So although in public affairs, as I mentioned, these were all about kind of calming down black folks in the efforts of to, to not get them to continue to, to uprise. So although the rise of these uh, black public affairs TV shows originated from a desire to contain black discontent during a period of urban uprisings and racial conflict, these, sh these shows served as venues for expressing black critiques of mainstream discourse, disseminating black culture, modeling black empowerment and consciousness, and highlighting complex narratives about fluidity of black experience, and they helped work to redefine black representation on television, right? Very counter to what we saw in those primetime TV shows that I showed you a few slides back. Part of this public affairs TV shows um, was Black Excludes Black. Not only has, uh, has state sanctioned violence against black people continued at pace since 1968, and in this moment with these shows coming about, it's about kind of talking with and against this violence and talking about you know, ways to combat the violence. Um, shows popped up across America doing that in very, very different ways. So again, not only has state sanctioned violence against black people continued at pace since 1968, but the pedagogical uh, practices and, and political messages Angelou offers in Black Blues Black remain as urgent as ever. By examining the influence of black culture on modern America, this program promotes black unity and demonstrates the political potential of art. This article, this, uh, 
talk today, based on my article, intends to tell a story of this public affairs television program and consider its intervention in both black liberation history and television history. Black Blues Black is not just an overlooked cultural achievement of the 1960s. It is also a television archive that offers new windows into black political and cultural expression in the black power era. In a time when black people had very circumscribed access to television or pu pu public sphere, like Gail Wald's history of television program Soul, I use Black Blues Black as an archive of structures of feeling, expressive both of particular time and place and of yet to be realized formations, some of which retain their utopian allure after more than 40 years. Centering the political moment surrounding 1968 and Angelou's pedagogy around black diasporic culture and unity in tandem with histories of black American violence offers lessons that I believe are especially urgent today in the wake of mass movements surrounding the protection of black lives and calls for restructurings of the police state. So Angelou, known popularly as an American poet, singer, memoirist, and civil rights activist, Angelou had a keen sensitivity, grace, and depth of knowledge that she brought to exploration of black diasporic life and culture in Black Blues Black. She was also able to draw her lesser known work as an actor, writer, director, dancer, and producer for her pivotal I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings book that soon followed the program. Because of archival availability and racial privileging of media studies, this show was a part of her history that is not often noted. Black Blues Black is a portal into Angelou's own political education, which becomes clearest when understood within her overall body of work. In her life, Angelou published seven autobiographies, three books of essays, and several books of poetry, and she was credited with a, with a list of plays, movies, and television shows spanning over 50 years. To bring a more connection to today, Angelou became a writer after a series of jobs as a young adult, including as a nightclub dancer and performer, a cast member of Porgy and Bess, a coordinator for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with Dr. Martin Luther King, and a journalist in Egypt and Ghana during the decolonization of Africa. Her time in Africa helped her as a native-born American understand the deeply ingrained cultural connection shared between people throughout the black diaspora. While in Accra, Ghana, Angelou became close friends with civil rights leader Malcolm X during his visit in the early 1960s. She returned to the United States in 1965 to help him build a new civil rights organization, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, although this initiative collapsed soon after his assassination later that year. By then, Angelou was living in the Los Angeles neighborhood of Watts and witnessed the destruction caused by the 1965 uprising. The experience emboldened her, and in 1968, when Martin Luther King Jr. asked her to organize a march, she agreed. But then she postponed. Consequently, in a macabre twist of fate, King was assassinated on Angelou's 40th birthday. Devastated by yet another loss of a prominent leader whom she considered family, Angelou fell into a depression from which she recovered by following the advice of her dear friend, James Baldwin. He encouraged her to tell her story. The wake of such tragedy made way for black discontent to be exhibited in television space. The pressure of years of uprisings and the wave of fear and remorse following King's assassination prompted some media executives to return to the findings of the Kerner Report and begin to act on some of the recommendations. While interviewing various black writers across America, producers from San Francisco-based KQED met Angelou at her home in New York City. The producers explained to Angelou that it was past time for their television station to do some programs on African-American culture and history. And given Angelou's time living in Africa, she might be the very person to put it together for them. Upon the start of the series, Angelou was asked how she intended to sum up the experience of racial frustration in one all-encompassing show. She replied, no people can ever begin a constructive position program, excuse me, constructive positive program for the future without understanding the achievements of the past. You can't see where you're going unless you know where you've been. In the spirit of critical pedagogy, Blacks Blues Black took as its premise the recognizing diverse black experiences was crucial for realizing the aim of black liberation. Angela later notes, um, before the start of the show, I'm trying to instill an understanding of Negro heritage in those who don't know it or understand it. Black Blues Black offered a sharp, sharp contrast to mainstream television programming when it first aired. At the time, primetime network television shows starring black actors often marginalized, maligned, or ignored black communities and pathologized black cultures and families. 
At a time when the increasing visibility of longstanding racial tensions opened up a new space for black television, Angelou's voice and artistry corrected for these narrow representations, educating all willing viewers about the multiple and varied experiences of black people and communities. So as a 10-part a ep series of hour-long episodes, the show celebrated the connections between blues music, black Americans, African heritage, and what Angelou called the Africanisms still current in the US. The series was produced for KQED's National Education Television Precursor of the Public Broadcast, so, excuse me, Public Broadcast Service and featured episodes on African history, art, Africanisms, positive and negative behaviors, music, education, business, and violence in the black American world. Although the program explicitly addressed black culture and viewers, it also offered history lessons and made political connections explicit for everyone. Angelou deliberately situated the topics it explored as common to black people in many regions and nations. The program proposed that black viewers should consider themselves part of an emerging black world wherein all regions of, of black America, as well as Africa and the black diaspora, were vitally, uh, vitally relevant. So I'm actually gonna show a clip of how the show kind of starts. So we're going to stop there because I could watch this all day, but I had to get back to the discussion. But I thought it was important to see how it introduced. This is the very first episode, and I love everything about this because it, it's truly, in a lot of ways, a, a DIY type of production. Um, when asked to do this show, Anjali knew nothing about television production at all, but she ended up being the writer, producer, director, everything of this show herself. So she actually uh, poured into books immediately after for the entire summer trying to understand television production and how it works. And you can tell through how she kind of stumbles through words that it is this all kind of authentic, natural selfhood. And I think that made receiving these messages that much more important. In every, oh, excuse me. All right. in every episode of the series, Anjali with her hair and an afro is draped in traditional African clothing consistently connecting viewers to various black diasporic fashions and cultures. Her clothing varies from brightly colored textiles to abstractly embroidered robes to color, colorful beaded bracelets, dashikis, and necklaces, redefining not only traditional, traditionally accepted television fashion for black women, but also the popular image of what black women looked like on television. The personal image was political, and the politicization of hair, bodies, and clothing became an important site to assert black identity and pride. With Anjali speaking directly to the camera, viewers can see her infectious presence on screen. In episode one of Black's Blues Black, entitled Positive Behavior, Anjali discusses games played in Africa by adolescents, and she demonstrates the various ways in which children use all of their limbs and create songs. 
She then cuts to a group of black children in San Francisco uh, outside of this, the, the built studio set playing the game Hokey Pokey. Angelou considers instances like these as African crossovers into the black American psyche, not only in the rhythm, but also in the tonality and the joy. These crossovers serve as proof to the, uh, of the cultural and historical links throughout the diaspora that Angelou believes are still instilled in all black people, whether they realize it or not. Using music, dance, art, and education, Anjali works to prove that although blackness is fluid, experiences throughout the diaspora act as connective tissue for all black peoples. Through the means of public affairs television, whose purpose is to focus on matters of public policy and politics, these collective black experiences are made visual to all races of viewers in the Bay Area and beyond through syndication. Angelou's production, aligning with the, with the calls of Kerner Commission report, was meant to teach these valuable lessons to all communities so that they might appreciate, understand, and build community about the complexities of the black American experience and psyches. Angelou's prophetic response to 1965 to Watts' rebellion in Black Spears Black is ever more relevant to this contemporary moment. In 1965, the CBS reports documentary Watts' Riot or Revolt, the clip I showed earlier, represented a crucial moment in national television programming as it called attention to the cause, effect, and ramifications of the Watts uprising, as I call it. Although popular in its reception, the documentary displayed many shortcomings because of its racial biases. The Watts, Watts uprising ignited, ignited in, on August 11, 1965, when Marquette Fry, a black motorist, was pulled over in Watts for reckless driving. A minor roadside argument broke out, which then escalated into a fight with, with the police. Community members reported that the police had hurt a pregnant black woman during the altercation, and six days of civil unrest followed. Watts, in 1965, represented a people, a race, fighting for itself. Given the history of police harassment toward the larger black community in a radically underfunded and underserved Watts neighborhood, this represented a moment of black rebellion. In episode nine, one of the, the final episodes of um, Blacks Blues Black, entitled Violence, Maya Angelou speaks truth to the aftermath of Watts' rebellion and, and violence in the American, black American world as she visits Watts again just three years, three years later to talk about the gain, the positive gains of, uh, of Watts after its uprising. At the, beginning, at the beginning of her episode on violence, Angelou states, I dedicate this program to the memory of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Denmark Vesey, and to Dr. Du Bois, to the men and women who are nameless, whose names have not come down from the centuries, of, but whose blood, whose agony we inherit. This heartfelt dedication makes it clear that Angelou is not only speaking to the violence against black people, but also bridging the centuries of anguish, turmoil, and the precarity of black lives as linked instances of violence in a world of racial hegemony. In the way that these present, present uprisings due to the violence against black people have led many to attempt to educate themselves on the histories of racial injustice in America through books and media, through Blacks Blues Black in 1968, Angelou is also having these conversations through literature and her media, presence and performance. Angelou speaks to the troubling reality that many people outside of black community claim to have a lack of understanding about American traditions of racial hegemony. To such a claim, Angelou faces the camera directly and asks her audience in a self-reflexive moment, in a country where the communications media has its tendrils in every home, every thinking in every level, how is there a lack of communication or a lack of understanding of what has happened? Through poetry, table reads, stills, moving images, and interviews throughout the episode, Angelou discusses violence politically, socially, and artistically. The episode features Angelou touring Watts, again, just three, three years after the uprising, with riot expert and educator Mary Jane Hewitt, who's seen the, uh, the top image next to her. Looking for evidence of gains and positive developments since 1965 uprising and celebrating the breakthroughs that community has made since. While touring the Watts Community Festival, Angelou speaks vehemently on self-determination and pride of Watts' black community and its efforts to rebuild and grow after the uprising triggered by the unrest, excuse me, by the unjust authority of the police. With the opening of the Watts Cultural Center, a skills center for job placement, doctor's office, and social service buildings, many new spaces for community welfare and social development were, lo were now local to Watts citizens and beforehand, the closest um, hospital to Watts was 10 miles away. The rise of these new spaces was a direct response to the spatial and racial segregation that caused members of the community to rebel in the first place. Watts was seemingly becoming a community that was finally benefiting from, from county funding, support, and attention. Arguably the most important moment of her time in Watts is when Art, was, was when Angelou interviews members of the community on camera and allows them a chance to speak for themselves, freely, opening, without reservation. 
whereas CBS's uh, documentary, white mainstream television documentary, uh, Watts Riot or Revolt, took a heavy-handed and biased approach to the cause and effect of the uprisings, but by mainly interviewing white correspondents and police. Black Blues Black is righting the wrongs of that account by allowing those it impacted the most, black people, a voice and platform. While speaking on the hostility that many black people in America have experienced, Angelou makes clear that this angst has grown because the black person has always been pictured as either subhuman or superhuman, never just human. We must arrive at the stage wherein we're just human. With her interviews of the citizens of Watts, Angelou is allowing her audience to bear witness to the humanity of these people whose lives have been historically undervalued and left without a voice. Black public affairs programs in general consciously re rethought mainstream television's tendency to insist that expertise emanates solely from those in power. So throughout this episode, Angelou also relies on her interview with Hewitt. The documenting of this black community and its humanity in Watts is celebrated by Angelou throughout the episode. However, Hewitt claims that although changes in self-determination and increasing black pride of Watts residents are seemingly positive gains, she notes that without some economic and political progress, I'm afraid that black pride will come to naught eventually and the people of this community will be called to rebel again. So although, although the year of 1968 was faced with much turmoil, the movements it created and the artistry it catalyzed forever changed the American political and social climate. Black Blues Black was an effort to draw a unison among an often divided people. This program is critical to the history of black television as a space meant to educate, inform, understand, and love the shared histories of the black diaspora in a time so fraught with racial uprisings and social and political upheaval that was purposely meant to place black people at odds with one another. We must know our history to know and take control of ourselves. The introduction of Black Blues Black and other public affairs television shows that examine the state of black life help to imagine new black television possibility and their place in histories of communication and education must continue to be critically addressed in scholarship and competition at large. Because like in 1968, the time to understand black rage and pleas for a new American order is drastically at hand. The rediscovery of this once lost archive reveals the continuity of racial violence in America and shows strategies used to combat said violence. This rediscovery also has implications for scholars, research, and teaching. Watching the show today, one can use these episodes to find strategic insights into how to learn about the history, music, art, and livelihood of all historically disadvantaged peoples amid a world of racial hegemony. With her episodes, Angelou created a syllabus that chronicled the lived experiences of black American people and how these experiences extended the temporal moment in which they were produced. This archival source is just one important piece to understanding and unifying an American culture in its collective pride and pain and making clear that these acts of bigotry are not isolated events, rather they are within the fabric of this country and tearing this fabric requires all people to learn this history. Whether you pleaded for names like Breonna Taylor, Tony McK McK McDade, Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd, or for the countless names of black people whose state-sanctioned murders have not reached national attention, the existence of black people often inherits the, the agony of their slain sisters, brothers, and siblings. In the same way that these recent uprisings have led many to attempt to educate themselves on the histories of racial injustice in America through literature and media, through Black Blues Black, Angelou is, is also having these conversations through her media, presence and performance. We must look back to find a way forward. So thinking of things that happened contemporarily following the murder of George Floyd, um, watching Black Blues and Black, one may be struck with by the fact that in an artifact 50 years ago can feel so immediately consequential. What allows for this timely, timeliness? And how might lessons from the show be brought to bear on contemporary black freedom struggles? Today, in a context where relentless police murders of black people have invigorated the mass movement for black lives, many are seeking answers to the very questions Anjali took up in Black Blues Black. For instance, how and by what means was racism embedded in this country's fabric? Settling of this country, Angelou once noted, was a long panorama of violence. Television has recently responded to this violence in varying ways. So if some of you may remember, uh, of course, after the murder of, um, of George Floyd, many television networks started to now kind of coalesce and talk about caring for black lives and what that means, right? Like hiring of black people um, for the art or finding ways to make it clear that they, um, that they care for black, black lives. And you know, a lot of it through marketing techniques, um, but there was a lot of conscious efforts around it. So we saw that in this particular tweet we see up there. 
Does anyone remember this moment when they saw, like, they, they, uh, they um, this is in June of 2020, I believe, where um, Netflix kind of, it made you look at this screen before entering Netflix, right? It was a way to talk about, you know, again, Netflix caring about black lives and black livelihood and black storytelling, right? So these various ways that, again, media, although very different from the way that uh, Anjali was doing it, media is realizing their potential to be able to have an effect in a voice like this. And some ways are more, you know, realistic or more, um, you know, uh, progressive than not. Oftentimes, these are still businesses at the end of the day. Their, their bottom dollar is making money. But these moments in which media affects people and educates them, a lot of networks tend to find ways to educate the media. We also saw it through um, HBO, whereas um, during this moment, they uh, took the, the, the film Gone with the Wind off of HBO Max, and they put it back on the HBO Max, but they added a roundtable discussion about the importance of the film, and they added a, a discussion with media scholars about how this film is important to learn about race in America. So these moments of education, in the very same way that Angelou was doing this 50 plus years ago, we see kind of a repeat of the way that they realized that with the consumption of media, especially at a rate where we're at now in streaming, people look to media to learn things. Or people look to media so much, so if they don't want to learn, put it in their face so they don't have a choice, like in this case. And again, here's the examples of with Gone with the Wind. When it was put back onto the website, it had these three additional things next to it as a way to understand the history of this film and why it's important to film history and American history. And BET as a program that, you know, already steeped in the history of being for blackness by and for announced uh, a lot of special programming regarding systemic racism. So again, a lot of these moments tend to coalesce when black lives have been slain, unfortunately, but it uh, makes clear that the media has always been a forum to talk about these things in very similar ways that Maya Angelou did this 50 plus years ago. In the streaming era, with the larger global reach of these platforms and homes across the world, world platforms like Netflix and HBO Max have the power and ability to match their words and pedagogy with more forceful content, such as calling attention to legal systems that need realignment, realignment and even more aggressively addressing their own internal executive leadership and hiring practices. If they truly believe that black lives matter outside of watershed moments, the power of these platforms must move more radically to speak truth to their claims of Black Lives Mattering in perpetuity, not simply when they're being slain. Thank you. Um, thank you for bringing uh, this. I had no idea she had done the show. And then while I was uh, here, I saw they're uh, available through YouTube, pretty mm -hmm. much the episodes. So I will use them in my teaching. I'm well, sure actually, you go to the KQED site. You have all 10 are available right there. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go watch them <laughs> yeah. tonight. Um, what was the response in the time, in 68? Was there a media response, black press, white press? Yeah, um, yeah, a lot of white press response. Because cool again, in this moment, there is over. There's a whole book about these public affairs shows of '68 uh, called Black Power TV. Uh, it talks about the big shows like um, like uh, Soul, like Black Journal, like Say Brother in Boston, and um, uh, Inside Bedford Stuy Vincent, um, and you know Bedside New York. Those were the big major shows. But again, there were shows popping up in every major metropolitan city throughout the U.S. So this was at a time of extremely small one. And Maya Angelou's name wasn't what it is now. Because like, I know why Kate Burr Sings came out in 69 after this. So like, the popularity of her was, was after this. So this is kind of when she was known locally. So uh, very few local, um, I found local newspapers talked about it, the development of the show, and a lot of uh, quoted white and black audiences saying that they're enjoying learning more about black history. That's kind of as much as out there about the um, response to it in newspapers was uh, it was enjoyed by everyone and it was a, a moment of them kind of a, an education for them that they don't get in the classroom. So that was kind of the major response to it. So it was positive. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, just uh, with 10 episodes amidst a uh, mostly local show, but uh, again, amidst a, a public affairs culture where shows were much bigger and longer, like uh, Tony Brown's Black Journal, for instance, 
the show kind of often fell into the fray, which contributed to it being lost for so long as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, ironically, you referenced some of the shows from the 70s, mm -hmm. and you know we had good times then, uh, and now we have good times again. Yeah. And ironically, you also referenced Netflix. Yes. Um, it's come under fire, uh, it's debatable, uh, about the current cartoon and yes. whether it's pleasing or not. Um, I remember saying that in some ways, the arguments against it now, mm -hmm. they existed for the old yeah. good times, but what makes the difference? Mm -hmm. And does it mean that perhaps we are seeing a depiction that hasn't really moved forward the way that we want. But I'd like to get your thoughts on that, as well as where do you think the internet will drive us in yes. this effort? Yeah, I, I feel, cause, especially because the book just came out, I feel, I've been feeling a lot of questions about, what do you think about this, right? Uh, and the show doesn't come out, I think, until the 12th. So I'm going to, I'm going to watch it because I'm inevitably going to be asked about it a lot, given the, the book just coming out. But on the... Trailer alone, I'm um, not excited about it at all. Um, again, it's an animated version. And the thing is, they've talked about doing this for about four years now. Um, I didn't think it was actually going to happen. I think uh, largely they rushed it because Norman Lear just passed. They were trying to get things done while his name was still, you know, while he was still here. Um, my issues largely lie in the fact that, yeah, you're correct there. The, the response to it is especially after doing the research for the book and research on the show, when I know about the show, reading fan letters, et cetera, response to it is, is kind of largely similar. Uh, why do we have to be in the projects? Why do it be low income? You know, all these responses of like uh, seeing the black community in this, you know, um, state of precarity. However, the political messaging, again, this is simply off of the um, preview or, or preview or trailer alone, the political messaging seems lost in the moment um, of this new show and this adaptation. Um, if it wasn't in good times, I wouldn't feel as bad, but it's taking on the name of this show and it's supposed to be an inheriting of this show's legacy. But I think the political moment in which black sitcoms were the only space to see blackness, especially in 1974, um, and where so much of, this, of the black artists like Esther Roll, you know, the main character of Good Times, so much of her agency was about constructing the show to what she thought was important. A lot of the political messaging is, is gone and a lot of the um, discussion of current events and livelihood doesn't seem like it's gonna take place in this newer version. So for myself, amidst the issues that folks had with the, with the first show, most of the issues came to that, like how the characters changed over time, Jada's character. But it seems like they're leaning into the, and playing off of the kind of um, the flair of the, of the imagery of the um, 1970s show rather than being in conversation with. And I think that is one of the biggest problems with this, with this show coming up. Again, I'm gonna watch it. Uh, it's hard to me, for me to imagine my, that, that changing from what I've seen thus far, but um, the initial part of the show that was about being in the space of political and social justice and black artists utilizing this, these kind of small spaces of agency they had to talk about their livelihood um, literally, Esther Roll going to the projects in Chicago to learn about what it's like to live in the projects. These very important things are part of how are they going to talk about black communities and also do it in a redeeming way, which was what her motive was. Um, you don't really see that in this new adaptation. And I think that even making it an animated form takes a lot away from that, too. Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask about what your future work, what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. And I want to say out loud, which I don't know if I've talked with anyone about this, but with Netflix, and my best example is 2016, I always feel like if a film comes out, they balance it. Mm -hmm. So when they air 13, then they put on the ranch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like that continues to happen. Mm -hmm. I wonder, and so that's just my commentary. I'm not actually studying it, but I wondered um, if you were thinking about these kinds of issues and what um, are you doing going forward? Absolutely, and, and then in the Netflix space, thank you for that question. Um, they definitely do that, and it's a matter of them, you know, all right, let's give something to this particular niche 
but let's make sure we also release something that is universal because uh, we, may, we may lose an audience to this niche. No one, a lot of people may not be interested in that. And also too, it's about the bottom line of um, when y'all go on Netflix, you see like the top rated shows, right? How much knowledge do we actually have that those are the top rated shows versus the shows that they want to push up, right? That's why it's part of these strategies. So they're going to publicize this good time show, whether or not it's number one viewing, they're gonna say it's within top three, so it's gonna make you wanna watch it, right? Because what they don't wanna do is, you know, especially with, uh, have, after the passing of Norman Lear, they wanna sell you the name, they wanna make sure that it gets the viewership, the base, and they want to at least um, show or perform that the numbers support this. Um, so it's kind of manipulated marketing tactics, but again, if we're not in that space to understand how those, um, those different metrics work, they get away with it often. And like you said, yeah, there will be something that kind of matches this. They're already kind of already promoting things now that are gonna be kind of the, uh, the white show in the moment, when that kind of you know, pol is the polar opposite of this particular you know, black programming like this Good Time show. And as far as what I'm working on now, um, jumping off of this, and again, this article was um, written because it was actually written for a larger collective about 1968 as like a watershed year in American politics and society in general. So this one landed square in that moment. But it made me think about other things. Um, I'm working on a project uh, right now about a woman named Joan Murray, who was the first black woman uh, news correspondent in New York. Her archives are in uh, the Schoenberg Center in, in, in New York, in Harlem. So I'm working on that, probably a paper, not sure how much is there yet, it could be enough for a book, but my second book project, uh, which I just got contracted actually, is about um, black women in, this, in 70s television shows, particularly um, stand-up comedians, and their kind of the afterlives of black comedy through these black women who aren't, who aren't often talked about, specifically LaWanda Page, uh, Marsha Warfield, and Shirley Hemphill. So looking at how these black women are able to, how they're able to galvanize their um, strengths in comedy, bring it to the mainstream, how they're kind of forgotten about, but how black culture continues to kind of push them forward. So looking at all ways in which uh, black folks in general have utilized television as a way to uh, combat social ills, but largely to be themselves and to find um, solace in their lived experiences. Thank you all so much, appreciate it. Thank you.